Raiders, welcome back to Sands Bikes, where you know we only talk e-bikes. And today, this episode is all about the Trek Fuel EXE. When this bike was released a few months ago, I reached out to Trek and said, I need to test this bike. And unfortunately, in Spain, this is a really hard bike to get a hold of. But riders, don't worry. Last week, I had a chat with Tom, a fellow legend rider and a fan of the channel. I don't like to say fan, a friend of the channel. And we started chatting and it's super interesting. Tom has had over 20 full, like hardcore, really expensive electric mountain bikes. And his current ride is the Trek Fuel. We're gonna cross over to Tom. He's done a bit of homework for us this week. He's gone out and done an extreme range test. He's put the Trek Fuel EXE in the top assistance and he has ridden it up and down until the battery's gone flat. We're gonna find out that information. We're gonna find out loads more of what he's thought and how he compares the new Trek Fuel EXE to the other bikes he's ridden. So riders sit back and enjoy this podcast slash interview or however you wanna call it with Tom and we go deep on the Trek Fuel EXE. Okay, Tom, mate, welcome to Sam's Bikes. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And you are riding, you're one of the lucky riders that's riding the Trek Fuel EXE. So welcome to the channel, buddy. Thanks for your time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. It's great to be talking with Sam Wordley. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's um, for, for a little bit of picture, right, is how this started. Like I put a video up last week, I believe, on the new Superlights, and Tom had this really informative comment that came back, and it was talking about how he'd had like 20 e-bikes and this and that and information about the motor. And I was like, wow, this is an interesting guy. We've got to have him on the channel. So here we are. That's how it happened. And, mate, tell me, how, have you, how many e-bikes have you had? Well, I've got a list in front of me, and I, I'm looking down it. And according to the list, and there might be a couple more because I admit that I, when the pandemic was going on, I I buy them and sell them a little bit too. Yep. But I I'm counting 26 starting in um, September of 2018. Wow, early adapter. Okay, we won't go through we won't go through 26 because we'll take quite a long time. Favorite standout three e-bikes. Ooh, I, I don't, you know, it's hard to find a bad e-bike these days. Um, favorite three. Okay. So my, uh, 22 gen three Levo pro, Yep. I, you know, and I'm smiling right now and I'm not normally a smiler. I'm just so excited to do this. <laughs> um, Levo pro is like, or the Levo, the gen three Levo is just such a great bike. You, you could just throw your leg over it and be comfortable on it. I just, it's one of those bikes where it, it doesn't do anything better than any other bike. It just does everything better than all the bikes. Yeah, I get so that's exactly probably my saying. top bike. Yep. Um, and then um, I guess the, the latest Santa Cruz Heckler, I had one of those and I had the super top of the line one. And I really don't like the EP8 motor at all. Um, yeah. But the Heckler is such a fun, poppy ride to bike, uh, bike to ride, sorry. Yeah, that uh, I really like that bike too, and I almost regret selling that one. And um, did I've you have liked... did you have the Heckler, the mullet, or the twenty nine er? You had the mullet. Twenty nine er. You had the twenty nine er. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I would think on that bike, if that bike had a um, a smaller rear wheel, um, it might have been a little not unstable. It would have been a little bit too. Um, I don't know. I, I liked the way the bike rode, and yep. I'm thinking that if it was any shorter, um, it, it would just feel a little loose. Yeah, no, totally. Like when I saw the the Santa Cruz come out, the new Heckler, I thought they knocked it out of the park. I think they probably put the wrong motor in it, and uh, but you know, like uh, if there's a few bikes out there, if they had different motors in there, it would be selling a lot better. Um, anyway, what's the third one? What was your third bike? I mean, lately, I, I really am digging this Fuel EXE. Um, I used to really, really love the um, Turbo Levo SL. Yep. And I've had SLs, and I've even had the the KSL, the Canevo, uh, which I 
didn't care for too much. Um, but the Levo SL was always a really a fun bike to ride, and it it had a good feel to it. Um, but after riding this new EXE, I mean, it it feels like a real bike. I think that's the greatest thing about it is even the way it delivers the power, it feels like a real bike. It's yeah. uh, it's pretty amazing. Those might be the three all time, just because they're they're all so um, different. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Totally. I, I get it, man. Like I, uh, I've been in love with the with the giant trance uh, E plus with the automatic suspension of late. And all my friends laugh at me. They're like, not laugh. They're like, they're like you've got like big enduro bikes. I've got quite a few bikes in the stable. They're like, why are you taking this trail bike? I was like, because it's fun. It's like seriously fun. Like, I need to bring my A game when I'm riding it, or it's gonna teach me a lesson. So, um, so when did you get the Trek Fuel? Uh, almost exactly a month ago. Okay, so how how many k's have you done on, or miles, should we say? I think today it was like 170 miles. So, two 250 k's, something like that. Probably uh, three something. Yep. Nice. So that's that's a good effort. Um, and which one did you get, and how much did you pay? Ooh. Well, I got the uh, the nine eight XT. Yep. Um, and I actually paid a little less than MSRP out the door tax and everything. The the local you know bike shop they kind of hooked me up because I buy a lot of bikes. Sounds like so it. I, yeah. I I wouldn't expect to uh, to get the kind of deal that I got. Um, but I, I got a smoking deal on that and my new rail too. So you're, you're a good customer. They want to keep you. I am. Yes. Perfect. And, uh, have you done any upgrades to the fuel yet, or are you planning on doing any? If so, what do you want to do? Uh, you know, I try to buy the bikes and then ride them the way they are, but I just can't help myself. So um, I, know, yeah. I actually swapped out the shock and the fork, and that, that's all I'm going to do to the bike. I, I actually thought that the way the bike came was perfect. I could have ridden the bike stock, but um, the bike's capable of running a 160-millimeter fork. Yep. And between that and the difference between the way a rock shock feels and the way um, a Fox 36 feels, like a Lyric and a 36, I had the 36 here already from something else. And it's it's got a little bit more initial flushness because you can tune it more. Yep. And so I, I stuck that on, and I had an X2 shock that I just had it here, and I put it on for the same reason. I could adjust it a little bit more, but and I don't so think the bike really needed it. Did you keep it at one? So you, did you go to one sixty at the front? Yes, I did. Yep. And one forty at the back. Yes. Do you think that in the stock configuration, one fifty, one forty? uh was a bit strange did you think it should be like 160 150 no but while i'm riding the bike i'm always thinking in the back of my mind i think that's probably about the for an e-bike that's probably the the perfect um setup like where you could ride everywhere and be comfortable yep um but no that for most guys i think the 150 140 on this bike would would do just fine yeah no no i i only say that because like when I saw it come out, I was like, oof, I wish it was 150, 160. Um, and, you know, like with the trance that I love and I've been having a lot of fun on it, it's not the type of bike I'm going to take to a bike park. It's just a little bit short and a little like it's just, uh, it's not, it's just not a bike park bike. But with when I had the Lebo SL 160, 150, I don't know, it just made me feel just a little bit more confident. And I did ride it at a bike park. So I, did, I think a little bit more is just a little bit more versatile. But at the same time, I think the Giant Trance is my favorite trail bike. So if you're looking for a trail bike, 150, 140 might be the, the sweet spot. So um, yeah. what other – are you going to do anything else? That's it. That's it. I'm, I'm, um, it's the first bike I've ever had that's all XT. And I have to say, I, I really like it. Most of my bikes have AXS on them and everything. And I run a, a SRAM drivetrain and SRAM brakes. Yep. Um, and I still like the, the SRAM Code RSC brakes quite a bit. I like the modulation and adjustment they have. But this XT bike, pretty damn good. I'm, uh, I'm really pleased with it. 
Oh, yeah. Shimano brakes are good. What I've found with the Shimano derailers is you need to keep them really clean and you need to keep them really well oiled. Well, that's good. I'm a little bit of a stickler on maintenance. So one of the things that I do before every ride, which even my local bike shop owner tells me he doesn't do, is I, I clean everything off and, and uh, lube the chain regardless every time I ride it. So that works yeah. out pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Because I that's one of the main things. Yeah, like I think it works very well, but it just needs to be lubed. Uh, where are we going next? Is it really silent? That is the question. Uh, I want to be completely honest about that. Is it completely silent? I'm going to say mostly. When you start pedaling it really hard, you can hear a very faint sound. And I, I ride with um, this thing on. It's called a boom band. It's like a little radio. Yep. And with that on, even like at a minimum, you you can't tell that you're you're pedaling an e-bike. Okay. Um, in fact, today, um, you know, I, I did a ride to kill a battery for you specifically. Yeah, that, and that was I, your homework. Uh, I came across a couple of hikers and their dog and I stopped and they saw me coming down the mountain and around and I stopped and I said, Hey, um, can you guys tell that I'm on an e-bike? And they said, no. And I pedaled right by him. Yeah. yeah. And I, I asked just because I was going to be talking to you today and I thought, you know, that would be an interesting question. So it's virtually silent. Like if you're, if you ride in terrain, it's got a lot of stuff on the ground. It makes noise. You won't be able to hear it. Um, if you ride with other guys and you're sitting there kind of pedaling up a hill or something and you're talking, you can't hear it. And if you have a, a full helmet on, yeah, you pretty much can't hear it. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. How Im how important is that to you for, as a rider? I don't care. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of like I, – I was kind of thinking like a lot of people think it's a big deal and like I don't really care either. Like I, and I, I don't want to say like – it's not the right thing to do, but when I'm out on my own, I put ear pods on. I, I ride um, if I ride on my own, I listen to music and I just like to zone out and just listen to music and I can't hear the motor. But you know, for some people, it's a really big thing. Um, and now we're talking about the motor. Let's just do a quick comparison. Um, how does it compare to the SL motor? Well, at first, at first. I was a little disappointed and I thought, oh, it doesn't seem that much more powerful than the SL motor. Mm -hmm. But you have to get used to it. You have to understand the way that it works and you have to understand um, the settings. Okay. Um, so once you get it set up and everything, and, and then we could talk about you know the, the app and, and the integration on the bike. Um, but after you get it set up, you can definitely feel it's more torque rich than the SL, but the way the power comes on, it's really sneaky. And it, it just gives you all the torque at once. And with all these other motors, they sort of ramp up, right? So you, you get into yeah. a higher cadence and they start to apply a little bit more power. Yeah. It, I guess this is kind of the difference. And I'm getting a little technical, like going back to my car and motorcycle background. So that's the difference between the torque and the power, like, the, you know, the watts and the Newton meters. Uh -huh. it, gives you, it gives you all 50 Newton meters, like, right away. Okay. But it applies it really gently so one of the settings on the bike kind of it, in the app is kind of like it, it asks you like how to apply the power like do you want it all at once I don't, I don't remember what they call it and it wasn't until that i maxed that out that it felt a little bit more normal so mm -hmm. it felt really soft at first um but uh, it works i mean it's okay. it's really it's really nice to ride it ha it just it's, it's very natural feeling yeah like oh, you, you hardly know it's there. And what about something like, okay, so you were on the Obeya Rise. Uh, how much the RS, the EPA RS, how much less power does it have to that? Quite I want noticeable. to say, it, yeah, it's noticeable. So at, at a higher cadence, when the, like, I don't know, 70 or 80, when that RS is, like, right in its power band, and the EPA, that's one of the things I don't like about it is, it gets to a certain point where you start pedaling and just feels dead after a certain point. Yep. Um, it, it, it does feel less, but at the same time, the, the bottom end torque might be as good. Okay. And where does it like to be with cadence wise? It doesn't matter. Okay. So it pull, just, it's, pull. it just applies. It applies that torque pretty much at any speed. It's the so, same. So, for example, if you're not the 
best climber and you're in the wrong gear and it's a techie climb, you can low cadence it up that mountain. You can like, you know, like really slow cadence up kind of like a bros will do or a Bosch will do. Um, sort of, but gear selection, because the motor does have a little less power. And I, I was kind of thinking about that. Today. Yeah. It's more important, but yep. within a gear or two. Yeah. It, you can, especially like at low speed, like it keeps the power very steady at a low speed. Yeah. That's what I noticed the most when I'm riding the SL, uh, the Kinevo SL and the Levo SL. If I don't get my gear selection correct, uh, it's all about cadence. That motor wants to be an 80 or 90, and it only it really pulls the most there. And if you get those cadences low, you're not getting the power. So the power delivery is really wild. Like I said, it's it's hard to even know it's there. And I'm going to give you a good example. It's another story because I love my stories. Um, <laughs> I've been I go out, like I said, and uh, hopefully this will make it on there with with uh, the Squeaky Wheel Bike Shop with their shop ride every Saturday. Yep, and it's mostly like the owner, some of his guys that work for him, and a lot of the kids from the local local high school mountain biking team. Some of them are pretty good, and they're all really fit. And then there's some coaches and stuff that go too. And so most everybody is on a pedal bike. Okay. And I'm and I'm out there, and they're and they're you know they're on like top fuels and um, super calibers, like bikes with like no travel. Yep. Because they're pedaling. There's a lot of climbing where we are. It's, it's hilly. Up until I got the EXE, I'd be out there on my, you know, my 180 millimeter bike or whatever, just sort of pedaling along, uh, pedaling along. And then I got the EXE and I started riding it in the lowest mode. So today was the first time ever where I just left it in turbo the whole day and just rode it. Yep. And I thought after a while, uh, last weekend, I told Bob, the shop owner, I said, Bob, it's, you know, it's pretty incredible. You know, at least my other e-bikes, when I'm in the lowest mode, I think it's at least as hard as pedaling a regular bike because the dang bike weighs so much. I got to overcome the motor, the drivetrain, everything, and all this yep. travel. And I'm doing it on this EXE after a month. I think I could pedal a regular mountain bike again. And he kind of called me on that and he said, well, you know what? I'm going on vacation. So right after the ride, just take my bike home and you can have it for a few days. And that was right around the time I talked to you. And sure as shit. I don't, I don't know if I can say that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, you can. Yeah. It's an um, adult channel here. Um, you got me to go buy a heart rate monitor and all that. And right before um, Bob went on vacation, he set up my, my Garmin for me and my heart rate monitor and everything. And so I took his bike out, and it's a large, um, brand new, um, what's Trek's fancy bike? Project One. Uh, top fuel 98 XT, but it's you know upgraded. It's got a better fork on it, yep. super ultralight wheels. And I pedaled that sucker 12 miles on my normal ride, kind of where I rode the EXE today. Um, and I could do it. Okay. But the e but the point is the, the EXE in that bottom mode really has a lot of torque. I think that um Trek must have had a fleet of SLs. And they came right after um, Specialized, the, the way this bike is built and the way it does everything. I mean, wouldn't surprise me, been, to be honest. They, they must have been testing them back to back because I could see when I'm riding it, when I'm looking at it, working on it, how they they tried to like one up Specialized. And they, they really did a good job. I hope the new um, Levo SL is incredible because if it's not, it's it's just not as much of a bike. And the million dollar question, can you ride it with full powered e-bikes? I don't think so. No. Um, no. But I, I have I have actual evidence. So going back to like how you got me to start using a Garmin along with my Strava and everything. Yep. Um, I don't have the exact number, but my average speed with all the climbs and everything on the manual bike was about seven miles an hour. Yep. So today on the EXE full with everything maxed out i think my average speed was like 9.5 or 9 9.6 miles an hour and when i'm on my full e-bike my average speed and i do the same ride three times a week right 11.6 miles an hour yep so unless i i probably only ride with two or three guys that are in bad enough shape to where i could keep up with them. but everyone else they're, they're going to leave me by you know they're going to be a mile and a half 
faster an hour per, than I am. Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of find the dynamic is kind of wrong on super light bikes. Um, like with my friends, like none of us are really very fit. And uh, when we go out and people like they bring their, their super light, I was like, it's okay. But the dynamic is just different. It's, it, I have a group of guys that we go out with on Levo SLs or I've got my Kineva SL. I go out with them in a group. But then with a the full power, I always take a full power. I just don't think that dynamic is right there. Um, and it definitely splits your friends up because, you know, you can't just like, you go, so, but what e-bike, which e-bike do you bring? Uh, are you bring the full power or the half power? You know, it's like, uh, okay, so we did give you some homework. So the riders out there would know that I do do the extreme range test because I don't have like eight hours to drain the battery normally. So we put the well, you put so Tom put the Trek Fuel XE in the top assistance, so the most power possible, and then you rode up and down your local trails until it died. Correct. I did. And your average yes. heart rate was what? I'm trying to remember. It was 16 less than pedaling a real bike. So uh, was it 137 or 147? Yeah, 137 sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was 137. Yeah. Which is and and how so how long was the ride and how many vertical meters did you climb? And well, I'll get the calculator out here so we can uh it was feet. And I remember um there's a difference between Strava and my Garmin. I'll go with the Garmin. I think I yep. went I'm trying to find it. I'm really terrible with this thing. I think I went like 16 and a half miles and climbed um 2,580 feet. 2,580 feet. So what yes, you said? and I ran the I ran the thing to zero. I have a picture of it at one percent. Okay, so that is seven hundred and eighty six vertical meters. So that is pretty good. Like I, that's kind of what I was expecting a little bit less than that, because the Trek Fuel has a three hundred and sixty watt hour battery, and the Levo has a three twenty, uh, but the Levo also has thirty five newton meters, and the Trek has fifty. And I reckon on the Levo, for me, uh, SL, and, and to be honest, I have not done a extreme range test, but I have done quite a few range tests. And I reckon I get around eight to 900 vertical meters. Um, so I reckon for my testing, the Levo is probably a little bit better. But you said before, uh, right, we did have a chat before just to go over our notes. Uh, he... <laughs> You said that uh, you reckon you're getting more out of the Trek Fuel. It's really close. I mean, I climbing wise, maybe not so much, but I didn't think I was going to go 16 miles. I really didn't. I, I more than 16 miles. I got back to the car with four percent, and I thought for sure that it was going to die on me on my way back because there's there's some big climbs on the way back, and it yep. didn't. So then I had to ride the bike up the hill I was parked on, and I rode up about three quarters of a mile, and and then I stopped it when it hit zero. And coasted down. So actually, I technically could have got another three quarters of a mile out of it. Out Interesting. Of it if I and uh, you know, this is so. Correct me if I'm wrong, but so it's a TQ motor, but the software is developed by Trek. So it's Trek software on the TQ motor. I think. No, I think it's all TQ. Because if I go to my phone, it's a different app than the Bosch has. Yes. Um. And and the app actually is very. Again, um, it's very much like specialized app, specialized app, okay. um, and it's as good. And it, and it even has some features that specialized doesn't have. Okay, nice. Like you, so, the app has a place where you can you can put your tire and suspension settings. That's in, that's smart. Yeah. yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's really smart. I'd like that. I'd like that in all the apps. To be honest, I have it in my little notes on my iPhone. That's where I keep all mine. And then I Me delete too. them accidentally. Um, so that's one of my notes. I do have lots of notes here, writers. Um, so how do you find, in general, overall, the interface, the remote uh, usability, the experience of using that system? I like it very much. I, I know that uh, this is where you and I do not agree. I think that some of the, the the bikes nowadays, like the Levo, I think that they put too much crap in the computer. I just wanted to tell me 
um, you know, how much battery I have left, what mode I'm in. I want simple stuff. I like yep. the micro adjustment and everything. I didn't care for any of that. Um, but it's very similar. Uh, again, um, Trek went directly after Specialized, and they they made it very similar. Um, uh -huh. But the remote is smaller, and the display is bigger. Um, although the, the display is a lot simpler in, in that it's uh, one color. And it's not quite the same quality of an LCD. It's sunk into the frame, and it's easy to read. And they they really really did a good job. I mean, integration wise, it's every bit as good, if not better, very marginally um, than Specialized. And um, so the app is is on par too, but it's so different than the Bosch app. So they've knocked it out of the park, basically. They've done a great job. They, they really did. I mean, I could we could go into the build more on the bike. Everything that they did, like even their tires. So Specialized and Trek both have their own tire brands, right? Yep. Um, and I noticed that on my Gen 3 Levo, I actually rode those stock tires. I wore them out. They were pretty good. They were good, um, yeah. They worked for me. Yep. Um, Trek's house tire that they put on the uh, EXE is like a, I don't know, it's an XR or an SE5 or something. Um, I sort of looked at it, and it's very, very similar to a Max's uh, DHR2. Okay. And it's a, it's actually a good tire, and the case on it, this this is another thing that Trek did. So when you look at, like, uh, a Levo SL or an Orbea Rise, like I was talking earlier about how Orbea cut some corners for weight. Yep. Trek did not. Like, you would think because that motor is so much lighter that the bike would be lighter, but they didn't. Everything on that bike is oversized. The pivots, the bearings, um, they maintain the tube size of the frame everywhere to, to give it a little bit of extra beef. It's actually pretty hefty for an SL bike, and the weight is comparable. Yeah, um, it's but, like, what, 18 kilos, 18 and a half kilos, something like that? Something like 38 pounds or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've got to go back and forth with the calculations here. Um and so the range extender, so you're going to get the range extender. That's 160 watt hours. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Um, it's scheduled to be here in November. So you should be getting 1,200 meters of vertical climbing with the range extender, which is decent. And do you know that it is very clever that our Trek and also Specialized went for the 160? You know you can travel with that. Yes. So you can take the internal battery. I went to Poland and raced a downhill event on the Kniva SL without the battery in it. I just got on the plane with one range extender. And you can actually take two. So you can just go and travel. I've done and that. that. Yeah, and it's amazing. It's like, you know, not many people know that, and that's a major benefit for a super lot. And we'll go to sizing. So you said you're 173 centimeters. And you went for a medium? Yeah. I went for a medium. And, and what's the reach numbers on I, a medium? I'm really happy you you, uh, you asked me that because I totally geeked out. I did the SAM here. I just <laughs> wanted to compare the geo and the sizing of this versus the other bikes that I also like, right? Yep. So I compared it to my S3 Levo and to a Levo SL. Yep. But the Levo SL, I compared it to a large. Yep. And believe it or not, the wheelbase on all three bikes is similar. The reach is similar. The stays are similar, although the Levo SL has the shortest stay of the three. Yep. The head tube angles are sort of similar. Um, and the seat tube angles on the Levo on the Levo and on the EXE are similar. So if you on paper, if you look at like uh, a Gen 3 Levo and the EXE. The Geo is very similar, but the EXE is 10 millimeters shorter in the same size. Okay. So um, we're talking, so the large is 465, something like that, the reach, the medium, sorry, in well, the fuel. So my, my medium, okay. So my bike, the medium, has a 455 reach, yep. which is exactly the same as, as a, a large, large Levo SL. SL. I remember. Because I rode a large SL, I rode the large Levo SL, and I found it short, but also found it found it super fun. You know, there's a trend now with a lot of my friends in Adelaide XBMXs. They're all riding 
small bikes. Like everyone's riding big bikes because they're super planted. But if you want to jump, you don't want something like super long that you can't turn around in the air. So one of my friends is the same, same size as me and he's riding a medium uh, Trek rail. And uh, it's just funny how, you know, the trends are just like the bike companies think everyone wants it longer. I think the sweet spot for me is 475, 480 reach. And I'm like 10 centimeters tall. I'm uh, 183. So I'm six foot more or less, five foot 11. So it's, uh, it's interesting, those numbers. Definitely. Um, so do you reckon the bike has enough power? For what it is, yes. And unfortunately, I find myself either riding with the, my local shop guys on manual bikes yep. or by myself because I don't have friends that my friends, you know, they all want to go full enduro and go to the bike park and everything. And so I, I don't have friends that have uh, SL type bikes, but I'm hoping I can convince them to buy it. Buy them. Yeah. I, I really like riding the, the mid power bike. You just have to keep on buying them. And selling them, to, finding good deals and selling to your mates cheap. I can't get a good deal on an EXE. I can't even find one. No, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I, I spoke to Trek when the bike came out, and I can't get one. Like I said, I'll buy one. I said, look, I'd love if you sent me one, but if you can't send me one, I'll buy one because it is one of the most interesting bikes. And also, like we ran that poll. So in the competition that we're doing the massive giveaway at the moment is, um, you know, say your favorite electric mountain bike, 2022. Number one, Levo. Number two, Trek Fuel EXE. You know, they got, Trek got, I think it got like over 10% of the market share. And we're talking about like 900 people entered the competition. So it's like quite a lot. You know, it's good numbers. And then in third position, which was... Surprised me. It's a giant rain. Uh, it didn't surprise me. It's it's a good value bike. Uh, but yeah, and the uh, and bikes that we've been talking about, like the Heckler and the Yeti, they didn't really get a mention. I think a lot of people have gone off this this Shimano EP8. Well, I think it's the pricing too. Um, and giant bikes, I I've ridden a Trans, but not the new new one. And I'd like to ride the one that you're riding. I'd, I'd like to try it. Um, but I've ridden a the year before that trance and the rain and they're they're both good feeling bikes and that yamaha motor is pretty good yeah um and i have i have other friends that ride high bikes and they have those yamaha motors in their older generations and i know one guy that has six thousand miles on it and he's really heavy i would have thought it broke by now dude that, so, yeah. the uh well the the sync drive or the yamaha motor same thing uh the pwx3 the new one is good it's really good. That's what I've heard. I'd, I'd like to try it. And it's got uh, a really amazing low end torque. So when I was talking about it, it's good for someone that maybe isn't a good climber because you can get your gears wrong and you can just muscle it up. It's, it's better than a bros for muscling up. Low cadence, amazing. Um, what? So if so, if Trek asked you. Tom, mate, you've ridden 26 electric e-bikes in the last five years. How are we going to make the fuel EXE better? What's What would you do to it to make it better? Wow. O overall, um, it, it's hard to say um, what I, I would recommend to make it better, but there is one thing that I do have kind of a big complaint about, and that's the bars. Okay. Yeah. So um, it's my bike has a one-piece carbon bar and stem combo and it is so stiff and then it came at 120 millimeters sorry 820 millimeters wide i mean it was like super wide yeah and i cut them down to 800 just because i ride at 780 yep with everything else yep um i might pull those off and put a different bar on there i completely agree with you on that like canyon's just done it uh, giant, the new limited edition, just done it. They're doing this one piece system with the handlebar. Okay, it's lighter, but no one wants like a one piece handlebar. Everyone likes a different rise. Everyone likes a different sweep. Like for me, I just bought some joystick handlebars and I didn't look at the sweep and they've got like a nine degree sweep on them. 
it's kind of like riding a um it's kind of like riding you know one of the old school city bikes it's just like and i i put them on my bike on the dream bike and i haven't actually updated it yet uh but the they're coming off like i'm not even going to ride those bars i just made a mistake so handlebars is such a personal thing and i just think it's a mistake these companies putting them on there like and it's bloody expensive as well those handlebars would be like 400 bucks they are and that's why i didn't cut them down to my length just in case you know i'm going to sell the bike or whatever exactly but, um i would put if i change them i don't want to put too tall of a bar on there because it's a trail bike yep because by changing the fork already i noticed that it it took a little bit away from the climbing and because the bike is so short it is not it's a good climber but it's not a great climber yeah so like I, I looked at rob rob rides and he put like taller handlebars and brought his up and i'm thinking that would make the front wheel too light yeah so i mean i, I would just re replace the bars with with a, a regular stem and a regular bar just because a regular bar is more compliant that that one piece is really really stiff and you kind of feel it when you ride and yeah. it kind of it deters from the way the bike feels and the bike is rock solid yeah i i I used to, well, like back in the day when I raced um, BMX and then mountain biking was starting, I had a Kona Sex 1. And I don't know if you were into mountain biking back in the day, but it was a really nice bike. And I put uh, some, it was a, I don't even know what it was. It was not an enduro bike. Maybe it was an all mountain bike. Anyway, I put some downhill forks on it. And the bike shop said, this is not a good idea uh it's not designed for that i said oh whatever guys um, and i went out and rode it hard and i snapped the steerer clean off and ended up in hospital with a broken shoulder and like a fractured jaw and i'm going to put it out there and say a trail bike is a trail bike i don't think people should be frankensteining their trail bikes i would not go 170 on a bike that comes 150 i think you can go up 10 mil 10 mils, no problem if they if they guarantee it. But you know, like the extra leverage that you're putting on a bike going up 20 centimeters is a lot. You're putting a lot of force on that bike. And uh, yeah, that's my rant. I just think a trail bike's a trail bike. 160, well, it, definitely, I would, I would, that bike should have been 160 to start with. In my opinion. Well, going back to your earlier point okay because when you when you're always talking about that and the bike should have more travel and everything i'm thinking to myself well if if that particular bike or this bike had the extra travel then it would almost be a rail it's a trail bike it's meant to be this way and yeah. if you want a different riding experience it's kind of like the difference between your trance and your rain right yep if you want to climb stuff and, and trail ride you, you get on the trance and if yep. you want to bomb downhill you get on the rain they're they're yep. purpose built for different reasons yeah yeah I'm no a firm i believe in that yeah i'm a firm believer I, i'm i mean now i'm testing more and more bikes and i'm definitely getting that i just think that yeah i just think that sweet spot is 160 150 <laughs> It's uh, for me, it just makes it more per like all purpose. I can ride it in. I, I agree with you in most cases, but in the case of this bike, the idea is, is to have a bike that gives you as close to a natural riding experience as you can get. And they really did it. I mean, it, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's unbelievable. And I have you get, get the it. bonus, you get the bonus of the extra 10 or 11 pounds, which gives the bike a little more stability when it's rolling because it's heavier. Yeah, it's it's really a great setup. I mean, if I put you on it and didn't tell you it was an, it was an e-bike, you would just feel like it was a weird feeling bike. Yeah, you'd get used to it and like it. So you know the fact that you're an early adapter, you've had 26 bikes, high end electric mountain bikes. I dare to think what you spent on these things. I, you know, I can see you're a wheeler and dealer. I'm a wheeler and dealer. I don't it doesn't end up costing me that much money to have these bikes normally. Um, where do you reckon it's going? Like, where do you reckon we're going to be in three years? I don't know. It's pretty mind blowing the difference that my bikes have, the difference in the bikes that I was riding four years ago versus now. Yeah. Um, and I know you have a lot more of the insider info than, than I do, but I know that the local um, bike shop told me that, for example, Giant is making some strides in battery technology. And the new bike to look out for is their SL because it's going to have a like a super giant battery in a small package. Oh, really? 
what I heard. Um, so I'm thinking batteries. I mean, well, did you see geometry? Did you see like Giant has definitely made amazing, ama amazing leaps in battery technology in the last year. So they teamed up with, I believe, Panasonic, and they'd made an exclusive e-bike cell. So I just got the new 800 watt hour battery um, for the Trans or for the Rain, and the 625 watt battery, watt hour battery, weighs in at four kilos, and the 800 is the same size and weighs 4.3 kilos, so 300 grams heavier. Well, so what my bike shop is telling me is true. Well, that that is definitely on like the the big battery, the 800 watt hour battery is here. It's already here, and that's backwards compatible on all their line. Like that's backwards compatible from the Giant Rain 2019 and Trance. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I like that. How like you know, like I think you know these bikes are super expensive, and I understand like the the whole new. Bosch system is not backwards compatible at all from even last year. That's so right. It's a bit of a punch in the guts, you know. I know a lot of people that have got the, the Trek rail and they're like, oh, I want to get the new remote, I want to get this. And it's like, you can't get nothing, man. So let's start that again. You asked me where do I think things are going. I, I don't know. Technology keeps leaping forward, but here's where I think they should go. Because you, you kind of touched upon it. Yep. I think bikes have gotten too expensive. Yep. My mountain bikes cost more than my gas-powered dirt bikes. Yep. Um, so I, I think that manufacturers should actually go back to producing frames in aluminum. Yep. And they should start reducing costs because I, I also think that, that worldwide we're heading towards some sort of a big recession. People are not going to be able to afford, you know um, – I never go for the super top of the line bike, but I'm still buying bikes that are, you know, eleven, twelve, thirteen thousand dollars US, which is really, that's really ridiculous. Expensive. It's it's yeah. really expensive, but it and I I mean I get this all the time on the channel, and everyone's like, "Oh, well, you can buy a motorbike." I was like, "Yeah, you can buy a motorbike, um, and you can also buy a road bike. You can also buy a top of the line downhill bike." You know, like it's not just electric mountain bikes that have gone up in price. Like everything, like all bikes have to come down in value. It's just crazy, but people will pay it. What bike do you want? What, want what would, yeah, but what would, what is your perfect electric mountain bike? What's your dream bike? I, they're all different, you know. Um, I really, I, I like almost every bike that I've ever had. Um, I'd like to try like um, the the giant that you're riding right now, the Trans. Yep. I'd like to try that new technology where the suspension, you know, adjusts itself while you're riding. Yep. I'm really interested in that sort of a thing. It's I, cool. I, I don't know. I mean, it was what I no. I I was more asking um, like what like if you were to build a bike with everything you know now, how would you build it? Would you build a super light? Would you build like that's sort of where I'm going. What what do you think the sweet spot in the industry right now is? Tough questions here, man. That is a tough question. Well, okay, for the industry, uh, like I said already, I, I think that they should go back to aluminum and they should start specking bikes a little bit more practically. Like who really wants to, like if you're a, a real rider, who wants to buy a bike with a grip dampener in it, yeah. right? Yeah. Why why can't they sell an aluminum bike that comes with sturdy wheels, a decent shock, and a you know, it doesn't have to be Kashima coated or anything, but a good set of forks and and decent spec and then not have it be eleven thousand dollars. Yeah, I know. No. That that's what I would build. And I, you know, Giant is actually really good about that. But going back to your trance, and I, and I don't mean to plug the company that's that's sending you bikes to test, but <laughs> They are the world. No, go largest. go ahead. You, we can plug Schwalbe tires, Insta three hundred and sixty quad, oh, Insta three hundred and sixty quad lock. We can get to all that. Um, <laughs> I have good things to say about most of that stuff. But going back to Giant, um, they're the world's largest bicycle manufacturer, from what I've heard. Yes, correct. And that trance of yours is only ninety five hundred dollars. It has the top of the line technology. Everything is carbon. 
Um, I really have wanted to buy one because for ninety five hundred dollars, it's like a steal. It's a great bike. It is a great bike. You, you can't like a, a specialized, um, you know, a, a Levo Gen three Levo expert is eleven grand. I know. But everything's I know. aluminum. I know. Doesn't have Kashima. You you could buy that that giant of yours, and it's got all the fancy stuff on it. I so I know. That's where I think manufacturers need to go. Me myself. I don't know. I, I just, I like where things are headed, but I, I don't know. I just want to ride bikes that are comfortable. Yeah. You know, I'm going to answer my own question here. This is where I want it to go. And uh, I was just baiting you there, giving you the, <laughs> um, I want it to go like this. Like, I think battery technology is getting wicked. Like, you know, we're seeing the batteries get smaller, getting more power. Um, you know, like the 800 watt battery is now the same size and pretty much the same weight as the 625. I quite like what Rottweiler are doing. Do you know Rottweiler, the uh, German brand? Um, yeah, you know, they're very uncommon here. Like, I don't see those. I don't see canyons. Um, there are a lot of bikes that you talk about where you just don't see them. Like, like a LaPierre. I never see yeah. any of those bikes. I'd like to see like a, um, a 160, 150 trail bike. I'd like to see it with 29ers with a short with a reasonably short chain stay around or 40 445. I'd like to see it with a full powered motor. Um, and I'd like to see it with a quick release 350 watt, 375 watt hour battery. And why I say that is because a 375 watt battery is about this big. It'll fit in your bag. I got you. And I want it quick release. And I want two profile settings on the bike. I want super light mode, or I'm riding with a group of people. I'm, oh, I want to go and get range. So I want it 50, 60 newton meters, uh, or I want to go and blast some trails and I've got an hour and I'm just going to take one battery, or I'm going to take two batteries and I'm going to go blast trails for two hours, two and a half hours. And I'll take battery in my backpack. That's what I want. That's what I, I like. That that that's actually a good idea to be able to just reach in your backpack and pull yeah, out another battery. But no one I wants like to ca- no one wants to carry a five hundred or seven hundred watt hour battery. I don't want to carry that. But uh, a two kilo battery, I can handle that. I can carry that. But also, I like the idea that you know a lot of the time, I don't need four hundred watt hours. You know, three seven five. If I've got an hour and a half, and also it forces me to be a little bit less lazy. Forces me, okay, Sam, you got to ride in trail or you got to ride uh, in this setting because you want to get two hours of riding in and you want to enjoy more of the downhill because the bike's going to be lighter. So that's kind of what I, I'd like to see that. Oh, um, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you what I, I don't want to see. And this, and I'm, this is going to be very unpopular. I don't know what the regulatory environment is like in Europe, but here in the U.S., you're getting stricter and stricter about everything. Yeah, that's the other thing I like about um, mountain biking is that I can mountain bike almost right outside of my house. I've got mountains, but I can't take my dirt bike up there. Yep. So I definitely, I think that the bikes have enough power. They don't need any more power. No. Because if if bikes start to ride themselves, they're going to start getting outlawed on the trails. Yeah. So I, I'd rather see the bikes like you're saying have smarter engineering than more power. Oh, no, we don't need um, more power at all. And what's the, uh, what do the Americans think of Sam's bikes? Is it a yay or is it a nay? We love Sam's bikes. It's uh, it's fun to watch. I mean, sometimes their, their videos are comparing things, and it's kind of like, well, I've done this on my own, so I'm not going to watch. But um, I've actually taken a lot of your recommendations, like um, – I, I wear ride concept shoes. You can't see over my shoulder. I put three or four pairs of them on my little bench oh, yeah. behind me. Nice, nice. Um, I don't use Schwalbe tires, but I would. They're just never available out here. That's um, but my friends ride um, Eddie Currents, and they yeah. love them. And my gosh, that is a heavy-duty tire. So one of the things that I've been doing now for two years on every bike except for my EXE is running Cushcore. Yep. Front and rear. And so with a cush core, you can really run a lesser tire. Yep. And not totally. get as many flats. Yep. But those eddy currents, you know, the full downhill version, I think they weigh 1,600 grams a piece. Yep. Yeah, they're heavy tires. bomb proof. 
You don't yeah. really need anything in those. But you know, I spoke to the Schwabi engineer and they don't recommend putting Kush core. They just said, you don't need it. Like they just say, no, nah. like, and that's with any of their downhill casing tires. So I, my go to, and I'd recommend, like, if you can get some, just try Magic Mary Ultra Soft on the front. It's a really good tire. Make a note of that. Ultra soft in the um, you want to get it in the downhill, the super downhill or the super gravity casing, kind of the same. If you run the the uh, the Magic Mary, then you got to run the Big Betty in the back, right? No, I run Magic Mary front and back. Oh, front and back. Yep. It's not. And you uh, have to run. It's not a very smaller size, right? You run yeah, a two four. I run a two point four. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's more direct. It it doesn't get you. So what I found uh, with two point six is it gives you a bit of um, like dampening, a bit of compression. Like you you lose a little bit from the rocks, and it makes it more comfortable to ride. But I found you get a little bit of like the beach the beach ball. You kind of just get pushed around a little bit. Like I like like this is super direct. You can fit through smaller spaces. And I just I just find it better. And also, when I was doing my research for the EWS, I spoke to a few pros, and everyone said two point four. Everyone runs two point four. I I understand the feel that you get with a thinner tire, um, but here, and I wonder what the terrain is like where you're riding. It's very, especially in the summer here, and when it gets hot. Because I'm in the desert. Yeah, it's very sandy. Yeah, and so I like a bigger tire. Although on my Canevo, um, I'm swapping from a two eight tire yeah. to yeah. a two six on the back. Yeah, yeah, two eight for me. I just got that. I just got too much uh, rebound from the tire. I was getting bounced around. Well, that's on the twenty seven five bike. So on, yeah. on my my other bikes, I think the track is two six and two six. Yeah, uh, EXC comes with two five and two five, which I think is too big for that bike. Now. If you were going to go like, I mean, so you're a you're a, a crazy bike guy like me. Uh, if you were given the money today, the ten grand or eleven grand you paid for the trip fuel, would you buy it again or would you buy something else? Oh no, I'd buy it again. I like yep. it. Um, I, I wish I could buy a friend to ride with that has another mid power bike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I know. I know. Like, I, I reckon my my Kineva SL's got about a thousand k's on it, and my Levo Gen Three's got about three thousand. And that's just because I don't have many people to ride with with the Kineva SL. Like, all my friends have full-powered e-bikes. And I've got one group of friends that have Levo SLs. They don't ride that much. So my Kineva SL doesn't get ridden that much. It should get ridden more. But I would say, like, I always contradict myself. Like, I love all my bikes. Like, I... I'm like, oh, I'll go out on this bike and say, oh, I love this bike. It's so much fun. I just love riding. Like, riding's just amazing on any bike. And I think going back to what you were saying about it's hard to get a bad bike, it is hard to get a bad bike these days. They're, they're all good. It's not like we're back 10 years ago. Like, these, this technology that we're riding in any of these base model bikes is probably better than the downhill bikes were 10 years ago. Probably, yeah. Yeah. So you got to think, you know, Sam Hill was rocking 10 years ago on some bunged out 26er and we've got we got some serious that's a good question um you know like you're you said you're 50 yeah, yeah i'll be 50 in uh, on november 3rd looking good for 50 sir very good mountain biking keeps you young what would be uh your advice to someone thinking to get onto an e-bike i think my biggest piece of advice was be careful with what you buy be strategic in your purchase. Um, don't buy too much bike. Um, buy like according to where you're going to ride. Yep. And don't don't buy something based on I'm going to go to the bike park sometime. Yeah. If you're, if you're going to run trails, buy a trail bike. If you're if you know that you're going to go to the bike park every week or two, buy something you know that, that you can you can mob on. Um, if um, you're going to ride trails and you think you go to the bike park once in a while, then, you know, buy the regular 150, 160 bike is probably perfect for about everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, totally agree. Um, and would it be a full power or half power? Oh, if I was a, a newbie, definitely a full power bike. Yeah, totally agree. 
Totally agree. Um, let me check my notes here. Do I have? I mean, we probably should keep the punters happy out there. Let's can let's compare compare the Levo SL against the the Trek Fuel EXE. It's quite a similar bike, correct? Um, yes and no. So the the Trek EXE really kind of geo wise on paper. Especially with the way mine's set up, because it's a little bit slacker. It's like 64 degree head angle now. Yep. Um, it, it's really right in between like a Gen 3 Levo and a Levo SL geo wise. Yep. Um, but it does not feel like a like a Gen 3 Levo. Um, I, I don't know. If you want to compare it to the Levo SL, it feels, even though it's a little heavier, it feels lighter, it turns better. Um, it feels less like an e-bike. Mm-hmm. I like the SL a lot. It's a, it's a great bike. And now that I'm thinking about it, that bike has a really, really short stay on it. Um, yet the, um, the track just, it's hard to, it's really hard to describe the way the power comes on, the way the bike feels, um, the build of the bike and the ride is so solid. I can't even be, begin to explain how tight everything is it doesn't even it doesn't even make a sound like the derailleur or anything doesn't even uh jiggle around when you hit big bumps and everything they did such a good job of running the cables and the only thing that i could think would make noise is if i had the 9.9 version and it had that little tool in the headset uh-huh yeah i heard that make some noise but other than that it's Would really you- dead silent wouldn't surprise me. Um, what do you think of the uh, Pazua Ride 60? You seen that? I system? would really like to try that because um, even it must be good because even Trek uses it on some of their bikes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, is I it think... the Transition Patrol is that the other? Yeah, other yeah, computer? yeah. I'd kind of like to try one of those. I have a look at this. Uh, I'll find you a photo. Um, this is what I love about running an e-bike channel. This is the new Simplon. That's got a um oh no, sorry, that's got a TQ this is the this has got a new TQ motor in it. Ooh, but look at the, the hardware on that. It looks good from here. Dude, it's um they've made it a uh it's a 170, 165 uh Enduro bike, so Kinevo SL territory, but it's also uh got a flip chip and you can run at 150, 150, 29er. Oh now that I like. Yeah. So you can play around with it. Um and yeah, there's a new. What's the new? You know, Knox. Have you heard of Knox, the brand? I have, but I, I think that's pretty much unavailable here. Okay. Yeah. Well, they've just released uh, two models. I think a 180, 180, and a 160, 150 trail bike, and that looks really good as well. And they've got the. Um, I want to try. Like, I'm going to Australia in two weeks. I'm going to try my hardest. Like. The Australian marketing people are a little bit more on the ball. Um, sorry, Spanish marketing people. Like it's uh, it's really hard to get bikes here. It's impossible. So it's crazy because they make a lot of good bikes there. Like, uh, isn't Scott Spanish? No, uh, Orbea is Spanish. Orbea, yeah, I know. Who, who else are we talking about? We got Orbea, we got BH, and we've got um, far out. Who have we got? Um, the bike, the crafty, the uh, oh, Mondraker, Mondraker, you know, Mondraker, Spanish I, as well. I actually want to sell mine, not because I don't like it, because I want to buy a pedal bike now. Yeah, um, and I can't get any takers, and it's I've kept really good care of it. It's like new. I didn't even use the stock wheels and tires, but it's just not popular here in the U.S. Unfortunately, but I, yeah. I, I like it. And then what's the other bike that you can't get here? Score. I've heard good things about that. Yeah. I'd like to try one of those and a Scott. Yeah, it looks nice. Score is actually BMC. Oh, okay. It's the same company. It's a sister company. Uh, they look nice. I've heard some interesting things about the build quality. Like I've heard some mixed uh, opinions about that, like how the actual paintwork comes out of the factories and stuff. So um, I'd like to see the bike before I bought it, uh, put it that way. And But I've heard very good things about how it rides. So. Yeah, um, and you mentioned Orbea. I have a bone to pick with Orbea, and this may have been the thing that that turned me off to Orbea altogether. So when you you buy, and I forgot about this, when you buy your Rise, right? 
It doesn't have any kind of a screen. Yeah, I know. Stupid. So if you want, yeah. So if you want any, any info on that bike, you have to buy a, a Garmin device. So I bought a super fancy watch. I spent a lot of money on it and everything, and I couldn't get it to sync up. Uh-huh. And Orbea didn't even want to help me. And nobody at the bike shop that sold me the bike knew how to do it. Yeah. And that in itself was enough for me to say, forget it. I'm going to let someone else deal with this. Yeah. No, no, exactly. Like, yeah, you need you need good customer service. You know, I've got um, I've got a lot of people ask, well, I've got a guy today saying he wants to get a Levo Gen 3. And he's like, but what about the motor? I said, look, everything breaks at some point. I've had like, like if you ride it long enough, it's going to break. All I can say to you is Specialized has amazing customer service. Like I've never had anything wrong. Like I've, all my friends have been warranted. Everything, you know, goes very smoothly. And I can't say that about all the brands out there. I, I agree. And that's another thing I would tell a newbie um, about, because I keep forgetting that I work on my own, on my own bikes is that um, if you're going to buy a bike, make sure. And that's why I said Trek and Specialized are the most popular. The customer service from both is really good. Yeah. Um, Specialized even better. Like you said, as long as you have the receipt on that bike and it's less than two years old, you can walk it into any Specialized dealer, say my motor's broken, and they'll fix it as fast as they can. Totally. Yeah, I know. Um, the guy I sold my Gen 3 Levo to, because he might watch this, so I kind of want him to see this. <laughs> Um, when I sold that bike, I sold it with a clear conscience. I loved that bike. I took great care of it. He took it home and he, in the, you know, like a day later he said, Oh, the screen is broken. And then the next I heard, you know, he, a couple of days ago, and it's been a few months, he said the motor went or the motor is making noise and they replaced it. And I, I, I didn't feel bad about it because the bike still had 10 months of warranty on it. Yeah. And I, I gave him the receipt and said, Hey, if you have any problems, just take it in. They'll fix it. They did. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a good um, thing to for people to know, like when you are buying a new bike, check with the warranty of the bike. Because if you do want to sell it, some of the bike companies, it's only first owner. Most of them. Yeah. Actually, Trek just recently changed that policy. So Specialized was the only company that if you, doesn't matter who you are, two years on everything. Yeah. If you're the original owner and you register it, They'll they'll take care of the frame and wheels forever. I didn't know that. Yeah, um, and I think uh, Santa Cruz, if you're the original owner, frame and bearings and things like that forever. Okay. And Santa Cruz customer service is also like because they're here in California. They they bend over backwards uh, to make their customers happy, but only the first customer. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's and uh, uh, Trek. Trek is good too, except when it comes to the motors. So luckily, the Bosch motors don't go bad very often. But um, there's an extra layer there. If you have a motor problem with your Trek and you have a um, a Bosch motor, you kind of have to go through Bosch. Okay. Yeah. Trek won't yeah. always take care of it for you, and that's kind of a bummer. But the the service is good. Yeah. No, there's lots to know. Definitely lots to know. But we'll we'll wrap it up, mate. Thank you so okay. much and really appreciate your time. And I wish I could get on the Trek Fuel, man. Like, I think I have to buy one now. You have to come over and ride one day. You know what? It's a bucket list item for me to go ride dirt bikes in Europe, but I, I could do mountain bikes. Is it expensive to go to Spain? Nah, cheap, man. Nah, it's cheap. It's you know cheap what? When you're here. So where would I want to go if I want to ride in Spain? Um... Madrid, where I am, it's good. Madrid. It's uh, it's wild. It's not a, like groomed trails at all. It's very wild. Um, then we have, and then you've got um, Ainsa, which is like in the Pyrenees. Um, I would say those two places. Madrid's really good. Um, Madrid's got a lot going on. Like, there's a lot of trails. You guys have. You have the uh, the Sierra, right? Yeah. So we have the Sierras here, and they're gigantic. Yeah, we have Sierra de Madrid, which is like uh, 70, 70 kilometers wide, uh, and the mountain range is 1.9 meters high, like almost 2,000 meters. 
So that's really not for us. That's not that big. We, we've got like a go to Mammoth Mountain. It's eleven thousand feet. Is it? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, in fact, um, when I talk about Downeyville all the time, Downeyville only goes to like. 7,200, 7,500, but you start at 25. Yeah. So you can go to Downeyville and do a ride, and in one ride, they take you up in a van. It's, a, it's like a – for us, it's an hour and a half, but you could go down 7,000 feet in one ride. i got to get to Downeyville. Uh, it's hard to get to, actually. It's in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. It's in, in Arkansas, no? No, no, no. Downeyville is here. But, is it? Oh, you're thinking of Bentonville. Bentonville. I'm I'm gonna go there this spring. So Bentonville is supposed to be the mountain bike capital of the world. Yep. I was listening to a podcast today on it. Yeah, it sounds and we're good. gonna go in the spring. My friend has one of those, I don't know if it's big out there, but if you're a rich guy, you have a Mercedes sprinter van. Yeah. It's all set up for uh, for camping. Yep. So that was the first thing my friend did when, when he retired. He built himself like the nicest one I've ever seen. And so he's gonna drive that thing cross country to go visit relatives yeah and i'm gonna and he's gonna take my bike and i'm gonna meet him in bentonville and we're gonna ride for four days nice nice man nice so riders we're done tom thank you so much for your time thanks for doing the homework thanks for doing the range test i'm jealous i want to get this trek fuel now you've got me excited i reckon in australia i might better get on one hopefully fingers crossed and mate you're gonna come over to spain whenever you want i've got Heaps of bikes here. Lots of, lots, on of that. lots of good trails. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, uh, well, you stay safe out there. And, mate, whenever you get a new bike, hit me up. Let me know what you got. And maybe we'll do another one. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, mate. I'll see you later. Thanks again, Sam.